Welcome to the Hoover Virtual Policy Briefing Series. I'm Tom Gilligan, Director of the Hoover Institution. For more than a century, our mission has been dedicated to generating policy ideas that promote economic prosperity, national security, and democratic governance. A hallmark of the institution is the caliber of our fellowship. Our renowned scholars have both academic and practical experience. Their work is rigorous, independent, and grounded in history, data, and logic. The dissemination of their work has led to significant impacts on important public policy initiatives here and around the world. These briefings are just one of the ways we hope to inform the discussion on difficult challenges before us. Thank you for joining us today. As a reminder, we will be taking audience questions and I encourage you to submit yours using the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. I'm looking forward today to talking with Bjorn Lomborg about his new book that is being released entitled False Alarm, how climate change panic costs us trillions, hurts the poor, and fails to fix the planet. Bjorn is a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution. He is also the president of the Copenhagen Consensus Center. He has been named as one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. In 2011 and 2012, Bjorn was named among the top 100 global thinkers by foreign policy for looking more right than ever on the politics of climate change. In 2008, he was named one of the 50 people who could save the planet by the UK Guardian. Bjorn is a New York Times bestselling author, and we hope to see his new book being released today, False Alarm, added to that list. So it's a great opportunity to share his book with your network in case you're interested. It's certainly a wonderful read. I, I highly recommend it, and it can be purchased on Amazon.com. Bjorn, welcome, and thanks for joining us on the day of your new book release. Tom, it's great to be here, and it's great to have this new book out. Great. During the first part of your book is on why we get climate change wrong. Let's start there. Why aren't we making good decisions when it comes to climate change? Because we're panicked. You know, fundamentally, right now, most people are incredibly worried about global warming. So Washington posted a survey of uh, American school kids, and they found that 57% of them believe that they're afraid of climate change. You know, they'll go on student demonstration and they'll say, and literally, why should I study for a future that I won't have? If you ask adults around the world, a, a new survey by YouGov showed that on average across 28 mm -hmm. nations, including the US, almost half of everyone believed that it was likely that global warming would lead to the extinction of the human race. This is terrible stuff. You know, if we really think it's the end of the world, Clearly, we should just throw everything in the kitchen sink at this problem. The issue here is that's not what the climate change panel tells us. And also, of course, panic is just not a very good way to make good decisions. Just to give you one example of this. So the UN climate panel estimate in about 50 years, so in the 2070s, the average cost of global warming will be equivalent to us seeing a reduction in our average income of somewhere between 0 0.2 and 2%. That's mm. a problem, but it's certainly not the end of the world. Just to give you a sense, because the UN also estimates we'll be much richer by then, the average person in the world will be 2.63 times richer in 2075. And because of global warming, instead of being 2.63 times richer, we'll only be 2.56 times richer. That's a problem, but it's also clearly not a catastrophe. And we need to stop this catastrophic conversation because it really hampers the way we think about climate. Interesting, why are we so scared about climate change? Well, fundamentally because we're being told story after story. I mean, pretty much if you open any newspaper or read any blog, you hear about how terrible global warming is going to be. Last year, there was a story in, uh, in Washington Post and many other uh, papers around the country and around the world telling us that a new research study showed that because of global warming, because of sea levels rising, we would see 187 million people have to move because of rising sea level. That's mm -hmm. a terrible outcome. But it assumed that while climate changes, nothing else does. It assumed that nobody would do anything about this rising sea level for the next 80 years. That's obviously silly. In reality, the very same study showed that if we do sensible things, that is mostly just simply building more dikes and keeping them higher mm -hmm. and keeping them better prepared at very low cost, we will not see 187 million people being flooded. We will mm -hmm. see 
305,000 people have to move by the end of the century. Remember, that's half of the number of people that move just out of the state of California every year. This mm -hmm. is because we're being told this story without adaptation, without a sense of proportion, then it sounds really scary. But the reality is, as we've just talked about, you know, it's 0 0.2, 0.2 to 2% problem by 2070s. That is a problem, but not the end of the world. Yeah. Help, help us understand something more about the current climate policies. And to do, James asked a question, I think that'll tee this up for us, Bjorn. He asks, what do you think of the U.S.'s decision to withdraw from the Paris Treaty? What do you think of the treaty in general? So, James, uh, obviously much of the conversation about climate change is really about the Paris Agreement, where almost all countries in the world went together. And, and if you listen to the official uh, story, basically decided we're going to solve global warming. Uh, Trump, I think for the wrong reasons, uh, decided to just simply skip uh, out of, uh, of the uh, Paris Agreement. But the reality is because Paris will do almost nothing, the decision to leave it will also do almost nothing. Just to give you a sense of proportion, the UN itself, the guys who organized the Paris Agreement, so the UNFCCC, they made an estimate of how much are we actually promising in the Paris Agreement. The answer is we're promising to cut about 63 gigatons of CO2. Now, to most people, that doesn't mean anything. If we're going to reach 1.5 degrees, which is what all politicians talk about, we need to cut a little more than 6,000 gigatons. So literally, if we all did everything we promised, including Trump, we would have achieved 1% of our promise. The honest answer is, that Paris will cost a lot. So we estimate probably somewhere between one and $2 trillion a year, and it will achieve almost nothing. So even if we did this all the way through the century, it would reduce temperatures by the end of the century, 0 0.2 degrees centigrade, 0 0.3 degrees Fahrenheit. So almost nothing. Spending that much money, a couple hundred trillion dollars for almost no good is obviously not a very good outcome. Uh, the be best benefit cost ratio is probably that for every dollar you spend, you avoid 11 cents of climate damage. That's mm -hmm. a bad way to tackle global warming. So yeah. uh, James, the short answer is, it's, it doesn't really matter that Trump left, but in reality, it's the wrong way to try to fix global warming. That's of course, because we're so scared that we're just saying, let's try anything and throw the kitchen sink in uh, at the same time. Yeah, Bjorn, a uh, technical matter. Some of our audience is having a hard time hearing you. So if maybe you could put the microphone closer to your mouth, that would be great. I will try to do that. Yes. Great. And, and also, uh, we just talked about the Paris Accord has been kind of not having a good return on investment. Is that a typical assessment on, on your part of other kind of current climate policies? They just don't, they're just not, there's not much bang for the buck. So uh, the only climate economist to ever get the Nobel Prize, uh, uh, Nordhaus from Yale University, he has done an estimate and he's started a whole uh, tradition of this and pretty much all of them shows. It is dumb not to do something about global warming. We should definitely cut carbon emissions because cutting the first tons is very cheap and you cut the worst temperature rises. That's a good idea, but you shouldn't do everything, which is apparently what most of our politicians are arguing. So what they find is you should cut some. And so instead of getting uh, to the end of the century, and I'm just gonna say in Fahrenheit because we're talking at an American audience, uh, instead of getting to 7.4 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century, we should cut so much that we get to 6.75. That's some of a reduction, but not very much. And if I can just make sort of a comparison, it's a little bit like having this conversation about how much should the speed limit be on the roads? So in the US about 40,000 people die every year on the roads. Uh, a very, very sensible way of getting to zero would be to simply say, if nobody's going to die in the traffic, we need a speed limit of three miles an hour. Three mm -hmm. miles an hour, nobody dies. But of course, nobody would want that because it also means you couldn't have a continentally integrated economy. You couldn't just yeah. go and visit your friends or your family. It would have a lot of costs. That is why in most societies you have a conversation, should you have 85 miles an hour or should you have 55 miles an hour or somewhere in between? But you don't actually talk about the three miles an hour. Unfortunately, much of the climate conversation seems to entirely neglect that there are both costs and benefits to making the same conversation in, in climate. How much should we cut? The reality is we should not go for the three miles an hour or for no CO2 emissions. We should go for the sensible part, which is you know, somewhere between 55 and 85 miles an hour, or in the climate conversation, 
is about cutting some, but by no means all. Yeah. Bill asked an interesting question, uh, in, in specifically is who benefits from climate panic? I mean, it, given, given the numbers you've thrown out, it's kind of, that's, a, that's the first thing you want to ask is that why, why do we have this kind of irrational reporting of, a, of the magnitude of a threat? Well, so very clearly, uh, what do media want? They want you to click on their news stories. They want to watch their, uh, their programs. They want to buy their papers, so on. And scare stories do that. Papers have always been focused on scare stories, not just on climate, but on anything else. You know, if we don't fix our healthcare system, uh, the world is going to go bankrupt. If we don't fix our education system, all kids are going to be badly educated. There's always a, the next catastrophe around the corner. The problem with global warming is it's just so good for catastrophe that it has been one of the mainstays for many uh, media to simply say, here's another catastrophe and we'll have another one for you tomorrow. At right. the same time, of course, politicians also get to do something that's incredibly useful. Namely, they get to promise to solve the world for you. They basically say, here's something that's going to kill you, but I'm going to save you. Mm -hmm. And that's also wonderful for politicians, especially when they get to say, I get to save you. And the people who are going to pay for it will only be in 10 years or 20 years from now. So not my, uh, my uh, election period. The, it, it is a perfect setup. And I don't think anyone is being bad of uh, uh, having a, well, some, I'm sure, uh, but most people are not bad uh, uh, players. I mean, I know a lot of these players and, and they really f strongly feel about this. Just like most climate campaigners clearly want us to spend money on climate, just like any other campaigner, healthcare campaigners want us to spend on health. The point is just, we should not allow ourselves to be beguiled just by the climate campaigners or by the media who sells st bad stories or the politicians who promise to save us. Yeah. One more question, Warren, before I get to the questions about how we address the problem. How, you claim in your title that, that climate panic, change over climate panic hurts the poor. How do climate policies hurt the poor? So fundamentally, poor people spend a lot more of their resources on energy. And energy is one of the things that actually make you able to do pretty much anything. And so for poor people in poor countries and developing countries, uh, clearly making them able to have more access to cheap and reliable energy means that they can not only you know, power their cell phone, but they can also get a refrigerator, which will get, get them much more opportunity to get good food, get them interaction with their, uh, with their neighbors, be able to have a cooking stove so that they don't have indoor air pollution, and of course, get the energy that'll drive agriculture and eventually industry that'll take them out of poverty. If we don't allow them to do that, and right now a lot of people argue that we should not fund, uh, for instance, coal-fired power plants in developing countries, mm -hmm. that simply means that those countries will be less well off than they otherwise would be. So that's definitely hurting the poor. But it also hurts the poor in the rich countries. So remember, most people in the US and other places that spend the most amount of their resources, sorry, their, the, the largest share of resources on energy are poor people. Sure. And if you make energy more expensive, that means they have to cut down on some of these essentials. We know this very well, for instance, for, from an, uh, an almost natural experiment back when fracking made gas much cheaper. Uh, a lot of people in the U.S. use gas as a way to heat their homes. And one of the problems with heating your home if you're poor is you can't afford to heat it very well. And so you actually have more people die from cold because you can't afford to keep it sufficiently uh, warm. What happened was as fracking reduced the gas prices, you saw people heat their homes much better because now they could afford it. And we estimate that it actually saves 11,000 people from dying every year from cold. And obviously, if we go back on that by putting in more costly uh, energy, because that's what climate policy is about. If sure. we make energy more costly, that means those people will now have to pay more for their energy. They'll be able to heat their houses less. And that means literally some of these people are going to die. Yeah. If you're just joining us, I'm Tom Gilligan, and this is the Hoover Institution's Virtual Policy Briefing with Bjorn Lomborg. Today, we're talking to Bjorn about his latest book entitled False Alarm, How Climate Change Panic Costs Us Trillions, Hurts the Poor, and Fails to Fix the Planet. You can buy this book at Amazon.com. Bjorn, False Alarm offers five solutions on how to fix climate change. Let's go through these together, starting with the carbon tax. 
Yes. So fundamentally, it's important to not just say, you know, global warming is being exaggerated and we, we're not doing very well. You also need to say, look, global warming is a real problem. We should fix it, but we should fix it smartly. And it's also about what are those smart solutions? So any climate economist would say, look, emitting CO2 has a net negative impact. That should be priced into the market mechanism. If you have a carbon tax that is a price on carbon, you are better able to have a good allocation of resources. So you should have a carbon tax. It should not be a dramatically high one. Nordhaus estimated it should probably be about $20 right now or about 18 cents of a gallon of, of gasoline. So not trivial, but certainly not the end of the world either. It is also important to get two things right about a carbon tax. It is not going to save most of climate change. It's going to solve a little part of it. So in the Nordhaus model, we will probably go from 7.4 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century from pre-industrial temperature to 6.75. So mm -hmm. a lowering of about half a degree Fahrenheit. That's good, but it's certainly not the solution. Mm -hmm. Also, and I think a lot of people fail to remember that, if you do a carbon tax, you also need to stop subsidizing green energy. You need to have, uh, stop uh, you know, the regulation of re uh, renewable obligations. You also need to make sure that you actually reduce taxes elsewhere. So you actually have, you know, for instance, lower uh, income taxes, which is especially going to help uh, the poor, uh, the working class in, in, in the U.S. So there's a lot of caveats around this. This is certainly one way you can do it. But you also need to remember it is only part of the solution. And of course, also, can you actually get, for instance, the Chinese, the Indians, uh, Latin America, everybody else to do this? And the answer is that's going to be hard. But it's one of the solutions, and we should definitely recall it. What about the role of innovation in addressing climate change? Well, so innovation is the second thing I talk about in, the, in, in my book. And it's by far the best way to fix climate change. Actually, if you think about most things that we've fixed in the past, innovation is typically the way to go about this. If you think back in the 1970s, we worried a lot about running out of food, especially in many developing countries in India and other places. You thought they were just not able to produce enough food. The argument was that India gets so many new kids, how are they possibly going to produce more food? Uh, I remember, uh, you know, uh, personally, my mom would be telling me, you know, don't eat so much. We send some of this food down to, to Africa. Uh, and I don't think I ever thought about how exactly you're going to make that yeah. logistic work. But the fundamental point is, of course, you can't actually save people by saying, I'm sorry, could everybody else eat a little less and then we'll send it back to India or Africa? That's not how you solve these problems. Mm -hmm. How you do solve them, and that was what the Green Revolution did, was we had technology that enabled higher yielding varieties that basically produced a lot more food on the same acres of land and basically meant that now India today is the world's biggest exporter of rice because mm. of technology. If we could do the same thing for climate, if we could innovate the price of green energy, and I'm not talking about what kind of green energy, any kind that emits very little or no CO2, mm. if we could make green energy cheaper than fossil fuels, everyone would switch, not just rich, well-meaning Americans, but also the Chinese, the Indians, Latin America, everybody else. So this whole point is we should invest a lot more in green energy R&D. And we've actually tried and promised that. So back in 2015, President Obama, uh, uh, along with the US, along with lots of other nations, along with Bill Gates and many other top uh, richest philanthropists, promised to dramatically increase investment into green energy R&D. Unfortunately, we haven't lived up to that, but that is the way we should be focusing because that's both much cheaper and much more effective. We actually estimate it's a hundred times more effective per dollar spent than dollars spent on the Paris Agreement. Oh, interesting. How about there, there's this interesting concept uh, called adaptation. Would you tell us what it is and how can that be used to combat climate change? So fundamentally, you know, again, what we talked about with 187 million people are going to be flooded if you forget that people adapt is simply to recognize that most things that you look at in the future, if you forget to uh, 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 take into account that people will change their behavior you are likely to dramatically overestimate the problem. Uh, mm -hmm. As agriculture 
uh, agriculture will get a problem with rising uh, temperatures, but it'll get a much, much bigger problem if people just keep mindlessly putting out the same kind of wheat every year as it gets warmer and warmer. Eventually, you get no wheat. Of course, you're not going to do that. You'll start switching to other crops. And mm -hmm. likewise, we and plant them at other times and so on. We know these kinds of very simple adaptations, which we all do. And which, of course, Holland has been a, a favorite example of simply having a country where 40% is below sea level. But mm -hmm. nobody in Holland goes around with scuba gear or even feel like they're underwater. They have just simply adapted to a world where they live underwater. Again, I'm not saying this is positive. I'm not saying that there's not going to be a problem. But by adapting, you're going to lower that impact dramatically. And that's why we also need to remember adaptation is going to be one of the solutions to climate change, certainly not the only one, but one of them. And we need to be honest about this is not just about scare stories. This is also about the fact that human ingenuity solves a lot of these problems. Yeah. Uh, Aaron asked a question about adaptation. And here's the question. She asked, as we're seeing with the pandemic, many countries or communities lack strong resilience capacity, capacity and the resources needed to adapt to new shocks. You note that adaptation is key to managing rising sea levels going forward. How do you propose countries building this adaptive capacity? So, Aaron, that's a great question. And I'm not going to pretend that I can tell you how the world should be doing that for the next 100 years. Uh, one of the ways that we do know that is if you're rich, you're much better able to have that adaptive cap capacity. So when a hurricane hits Florida, it'll kill a few people. It'll cause a lot of damage but it will not be disruptive to the economy in the long run. Whereas if the same type of hurricane hits, for instance, Guatemala, as Hurricane Mitch did back in 1998, it'll basically eradicate the country. It'll cost uh, tens of thousands of lives and decimate the economy for years to come. So the idea here is simply to say, if we make sure that you make countries better off, you're much more likely to have more adaptive capacity. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways, of course, is to recognize that as we're spending more resources on cutting our carbon emissions, that is money that we can't spend on, for instance, adaptation and many, many other things, like, for instance, avoiding easily curable infectious diseases and bad education around the world or, or uh, uh, nutrition. Th there's always a trade-off between the different things that we spend our resources on. We should spend some of it on cutting carbon emissions, but our almost monotonous monomaniacal. I wanted to use that word for so long. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, our very one-sided focus on uh, cutting carbon emissions means that we end up forgetting all these other things. So we should definitely focus more on adaptive capacity. And one of the ways to do that is to make countries richer. But there's also a lot of other things. You need to have civil society along. You need to have a lot of other solutions. And that's where we're going to be spending a lot of our focus. Uh, so Aaron, I hope you will be along with, with on, on that campaign instead of just only focusing on cutting carbon emissions. Yeah. You, in your book, you talk about human adaptation to to climate change. Alan asked a question uh, to you. Do you think that other species will adapt fast enough to climate change? So what I'm talking about mostly is on human adaptation and humans and how we interact with this world. So there's definitely an issue with animals. Uh, and, and so it is likely that animals will have a harder time in a world that has global warming. We've actually tried to take that into account in the economic models, but I'm sure we're not totally successful in that. And so I think one of the things we need to recognize is the most important part about what threatens future species is not actually climate. Climate will have a negative impact, but by most estimates, even the World Wildlife Fund and others, it'll probably be 10, 15% of the impact. Most of this comes from especially poor countries that just raise their forests in order to grow enough food to provide for their families. So again, if we make sure that these countries get richer, we're much more likely to both have a situation where they'll stop raising their forest and instead you know, move to cities and become web designers. But also, and at the same time, as you get richer, you want to spend more on uh, uh, nature and you want to set aside right. more parts for nature reserves. So you actually end up in a situation where you do much more good for nature. But yes, climate change will be a bigger problem uh, for, for nature than it will be for human beings, simply because we can adapt better than they can. 
Yeah. Jordan, in your book, you focus on geoengineering as a solution. What is it and how does it work? So the idea here is to recognize that when you talk about uh, solving the problem of global warming, it's really about making sure that we don't get so much of a temperature rise. One way you can do that is simply by changing the thermostat of the planet. We actually know that back in 1991, uh, a big volcano in the Philippines, Mount Pinatubo erupted, put out lots of sulfur dioxide in the stratosphere, so the outer parts of the atmosphere of the earth, and put it a, a, a little bit of a haze around the, the earth. You couldn't see it, it was about 2%. But what it did was it reflected some of the sunlight back, and so it lowered the temperature of the planet about one degree Fahrenheit for about two years. Mm -hmm. So that is a natural indication of what we could replicate and actually make the planet cooler simply through technological means. Now, it's important to say, this is an untested technology. So I'm not, and I don't think most people would be advocating, let's go and do it. But we should investigate it for two reasons, partly because it's incredibly cheap. So we estimate you could probably avoid all of global warming for a cost across this century of about $9 billion. Hmm. That's about 10,000 times cheaper than anything else we're talking about. So it's clearly very, very cheap. Also, it's the only way that you can cut temperature rises dramatically fast. You know, we've seen what climate policy do, uh, and it takes forever to just do a little bit, and then there's a, the whole lag in the climate system. If we do uh, buy uh, geoengineering, you can actually do this within a matter of days or weeks. So it's also a very quick way if you really need a backup plan. And I think the last part is because it's so cheap, it's not inconceivable that over the next century, a rich billionaire or even just a very uh, uh, motivated NGO will try and do this. You know, hmm. they were, they're going to implement this geoengineering. And so we want to make sure that it's actually all in all going to do good. Or if there's something bad lurking out there, we need to have investigated. So I'm not saying we should do it. I'm saying let's research it so we have the option and we also know if it doesn't work. Yeah, Gregory asked a question, aerosol screening, geoengineering, how soon? And I guess that is the broader question, Doran, is that where is the technology? How close are we to having a, having a feasible geoengineering solution to climate change? So I, th I think most people would argue we could do it today. The point is we don't know how whether there's something bad lurking out in, these, in, in the dark parts of this, because we know how to do Mount Pinatubo. Uh, you know, some people are suggesting we just simply put airplanes up and, and release uh, sulfur dioxide in the stratosphere and we'd be done. We could basically avoid all the temperature. Remember, again, it's not going to solve all problems and not going to solve uh, acidification of the oceans, uh, but no solutions will solve any of uh, 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 the entire problem of global warming. And this would solve much, much more. But, and that's the point, we don't know whether there's something bad lurking out in the, in, the, in the shadows. So we should investigate it, but we shouldn't be doing it right now. And certainly also, given that even in 50 years, uh, the negative impact of global warming is somewhere between 0.2 and 2% of GDP, it's probably only later that we really want to start thinking about, okay, now it's so bad, we want to do something with geoengineering. Yeah. You know, you've mentioned this several times in your talk so far, and in your book, you propose prosperity or economic growth has a climate policy that we need. Could you explain that? In fact, it sounds counterintuitive. Isn't yes, it does. In prosperity, which got us in this climate change problem in the first place? Yes, yes. And a lot of people who are arguing very strongly about climate change feel very ambivalent, to say the least, on, on, on growth. Uh, so I worked a lot uh, with uh, uh, Thomas Schelling, who's a Nobel laureate uh, in economics. And, and he very often, he, he's credit with making this point. He said, you know, imagine if you're a rich Chinese or a rich Indian or a rich Congolese uh, in 2100, which you will be looking back on 2020 and saying how odd these people were so focused on helping me, who's fairly rich, a tiny bit through climate change policies. Instead of focusing on our, our, our poor forefathers, you know, the, the guys who actually lived in 2020, who were much poorer and needed their help much more and where we could help them a lot more. Mm -hmm. That's the real issue is to ask, where can we actually help the most? It turns out that if you help people get out of poverty, and that was a little bit what I alluded to before uh, with uh, Hurricane Mitch in, in Guatemala. If you make Guatemalans less poor, 
when they're hit by hurricanes, whether made by climate change, and many of them still won't, you know, they're just normal hurricanes that would have happened anyway, they will be much better able to deal with it. They will have much higher adaptive capacity. That is, they will be better able to handle the problems that climate th uh, change throws at them. Plus, of course, if they're better off, they will be better off. Their kids won't die as much. They'll be better educated. They'll be better fed. All these other good things. So what we have to recognize is that while we should definitely put a carbon tax, we should have innovation, we should have adaptation, and also have a, a geoengineering strategy in the back pocket, we should also recognize that prosperity is the way that we can actually make most people much better off, both to tackle climate change better give them better adaptive capacity, but also just simply to make their lives better. Yeah, Bjorn, let me, let me challenge you on that. Maybe people would look at China as a modern example of rapid growth that has made their people more prosperous and better off, but fueled on coal energy, which has been very harmful to climate Absolutely. change emissions. So how, how do you balance that need for prosperity with, with the China example? Well, the point is twofold. Partly, if you ask almost any person in the developing countries, what would you like to be? They'd like to be China. I mean, they're, they probably like not the, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 the uh, dictatorship part of it, but they'd certainly like the development part of, of China. The second part is to recognize that China has gone from being an incredibly backwards and terribly, terribly poor country to a country that is no longer very uh, that's uh, no longer going to be very harmed by global warming because they're rich. And so not only is it intrinsically good for Chinese to become a lot richer and have much less of poverty problems, but it also means that they're much more robust against climate change. That's and good. so actually studies show that when you're really poor, the best way to help really poor countries, just if you only care about climate change, is actually to make them richer. But of course, we don't just care about climate change. We also care about just making these people richer and making them better off. So it's absolutely true that when people say, but it's also a problem as you get richer, you actually emit more CO2. That's absolutely true. But you're not going to solve this mostly by telling poor countries to say, I'm sorry, you have to stay poor. That's just not going to work. What we need to recognize is they need to get rich. And in the process, we also need to innovate the energy sources that right. will power the rest of the 21st century, but make sure that they're low carbon uh, emissions. And that is about our innovation. That's where we really need to spend our resources. Yeah. Uh, you're listening to Visiting Fellow Bjorn Lomborg. You can find more research by Hoover Fellows at hoover.org. Um, Bjorn, you mentioned alternatives. James asked the following question. We got a lot of questions in, of this genre. What alternative sources are the most economically feasible at this time to promote green energy? What about nuclear? So nuclear is one of those things that absolutely has the most potential to you know, uh, provide a very large part of the energy for the future because it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, Oh, I'm sorry. Sometimes I just forget these words. Uh, it's base load power. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So it, you know, it basically can provide us power. Also, when the sun is not shining or when the wind is not blowing, it can provide us 24-7 power. Mm -hmm. The problem is that for the last three generations, nuclear power has actually become more expensive, not cheaper. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so right now is not competitive at all. But you know, Gates and others are actually investing in fourth generation nuclear power, which they say can be much cheaper. One of the tricks is to simply make it a, an assembly production. So it's just Legos that you put together and then you have a nuclear power plant, maybe a very small one, and they're going to be much safer because you have a uh, little modules, So they basically can't melt down and so on. They're mm -hmm. saying this can be done and it can be done so that it will be very, very cheap. I think that's wonderful and let's by all means investigate this. The problem and the reservation I have is that was also what they told us about the other three generations. So let's wait and see. This could be one of the many solutions. So, you know, I, I outline a very, very vast range of technologies. So you could definitely imagine solar and wind with mu lots and lots of battery. They're not competitive now, but we could yeah. make it much more competitive. Nuclear power. Fusion, if that ever happens. Uh, Craig Venter, the guy who cracked the human genome, he has this idea of putting out algae, a special kind of algae on the ocean surface and basically grow oil. So they use sunlight and CO2 
to make oil. We'll put it in our cars, drive around, and we'll just basically emit those, that, those same molecules of CO2. So it'll be net zero. That would be a wonderful opportunity. Again, it's not cost effective, but the trick here is to recognize there are thousands of those ideas. We spend research money on all of those ideas. Not all of them are gonna come through. Most of them are gonna fail, that's fine. We really just need one or a few of these to come through. And those are the ones that'll power the 21st century. Yeah, but let's uh, come back to the United States for a second and talk about the politics of energy policy here. Uh, last year, some democratic leaders proposed something called the Green New Deal. And I believe that Vice President Biden, as part of his campaign, came out with the energy plan a few weeks ago. Can you tell us a little bit about, a little bit about those plans and do they pass a, a standard cost benefit test? Yeah. So, so again, we don't know whether they pass a cost benefit test because they haven't even costed their, uh, their estimates. Uh, so uh, the Green New Deal is a, is a rambling kind of thing with lots and lots of favorite policies. But if you try to estimate what's the cost of the green parts of this, it's probably somewhere between 10 and $20 trillion. So mm -hmm. you certainly want to make sure that it actually delivers a lot of climate good. Uh, the problem is that much of this, for instance, retrofitting homes, which is a very large part of this, is the idea of if you make homes more energy efficient, you will save energy and hence you will actually have less emissions. It turns out that that is only marginally true and it's often very, very expensive. So you end up spending a lot more money than what you plan and you end up with much lower emission reductions than what you had hoped. Uh, so the biggest study in the U.S. actually finds that this is not a good investment for money. A lot of the other things are simply, you know, doing the, uh, uh, the Paris Agreement. Uh, so, you know, cutting carbon emissions through uh, subsidies of renewables or uh, renewable obligations or that kind of thing. And basically, again, what we find is it costs lots of money and it cuts fairly little CO2. They mm -hmm. also want to invest, invest lots more money in uh, uh, research and development on green energy. I love that, and they should definitely be doing that. But there needs to be a much bigger focus on what is actually effective rather than just let's throw money at everything. And of course, this comes from the basic fact of if you think this is the end of the world, if you think this is an asteroid hurtling towards Earth, the only thing you have to do is to get Bruce Willis and go up there and nuke that asteroid, right? I'm sure a lot of our younger viewers don't even get this reference anymore. But, uh, but you know, the, the fundamental point is, if it's not an asteroid, if it's more sort of uh, 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 diabetes, you know, a problem that you have to live with, and I think that's a much more relevant way of thinking about global warming, it's a problem that you have to find a way to live with and somewhat mitigate we need to be much more careful in how we spend our resources. Do the smart things, don't do the stupid things. And of course that will also leave lots more money for all the other things that we also need to spend on. Yeah, it is puzzling that so many of these proposals and policies don't even come close to passing a cost benefit test. I have an interesting question from a, from a friend, Joel, and he asked the following. When the president of the UN Foundation, Timothy Wirth writes, and in quote, even if the theory of global warming is wrong, we will be doing the right thing in terms of economic and environmental policy. We've got to ride this global warming issue. What do you think is his real uh, agenda when he writes something like that? Well, I've, I've seen that quote and, and he, hasn't, uh, he hasn't disputed it. But I think, I think a lot of people, uh, and, and honestly, you know, I, I, I know Tim a little bit and he hates me, but, uh, but you know, I, I think he's a pretty good guy. And I think a lot of these people are, you know, really well motivated. They want to do good. And, and you know, you latch on to st stuff that fits your personal agenda. Uh, I understand how that happens. I think what we, the rest of the world needs to then say is, sure, look, Tim, I get your point. I get that this is what you want to advocate for, but you're asking me for my money to fund this. I want to make sure that it actually makes economic sense, that this is the best way I can help uh, uh, both for global warming and for all the other problems in the world. I think we just simply need to go back and say, look, I get what you, where you're coming from, but we want this to be more rational. That's really what this book is about. It's about getting us back on track to dealing with this like we do with any other policy. When we talk about uh, uh, you know, healthcare policy, certainly where I come from in Europe, you know, we expect doctors to exaggerate the problem. If you talk about a health uh, education problem, of course the teachers are gonna exaggerate the problem. That's part of their job to do that. But the rest of us know 
that we also have to hold back and say, yeah, sure, but there's lots of other money that needs to get distributed. And that's why we need to stop having this, it's the end of the world, and start having this conversation. It's one problem, it's not a trivial problem, but it's one problem among many. How do we tackle climate change? We do so by being smart, but also being very critical and say, I'm sorry, What's the cost? What are the benefits? And as you point out, often they don't add up, but you know, sometimes they do. And we should be spending the money on the places where the cost benefit ratio is actually above one. Yeah. We have several questions uh, that pertain to the, the global nature of the climate change problem that we're in the commons here. And Cornelia, I think, frames it best. Uh, she says, how can we ask Americans to cut emissions when we know that the Chinese are building coal-based utilities and have no intention of honoring any change and, and their commitment to climate change is just lip service. Um, it's hard for me to know. I mean, my, my sense is that Chinese actually care somewhat about it. Also, if you ask uh, Chinese, it turns out that most Chinese are very, very worried about global warming, much more so than Americans. So I think eventually mm -hmm. even the Communist Party will have to somewhat adjust to that fact if they want to stay in power. Uh, so so I, I, I think the answer is the Chinese are going to do some of this. But the reality I think Cornelia is pointing out is you can't have a climate policy that relies on everybody doing what is costly to them and will help very, very little in a hundred years. That's just not a sustainable theory of change. What you can do is say, let's spend a lot more on research and development in green energy research for two reasons, partly because spending money on research and development because it's almost invariably underfunded because there's lots of, of public uh, uh, IP that's very, very hard to protect. So private companies don't do it, but it's really great for the public in general to have this. But also when you spend money on research and development, you develop all these other great things. So, and, and I'm making this up because I don't know what the future is gonna bring. But if we look at much better ways to get batteries that'll store energy, we'll also end up with batteries that are gonna be much better for your cell phone. And we can sell that and we can actually become much richer on that. So the idea here is to say, let's spend less money, much smarter an investment in green energy R&D, and it'll also have lots of other benefits. And even if the Chinese don't do it, it'll still be beneficial for Americans because you will get all these other spin-off technologies and you will be able to do all the cell phones with great batteries. Yeah, yeah. I have several questions that, that kind of uh, argue that humans are the root of the problem, and Brett puts it best, and I want you to just take your shot at this. Would you agree that population, or more precisely overpopulation, is at the root of the issue here? And if so, how can we governments work towards a solution? So a lot of people for, for a very long time have been talking about population is the root cause of the problem. It was very, very popular to say this back in the 60s and 70s. And in some very obvious way, the more people there are, the more emissions you're gonna have. Uh, but I think there's two big problems with this. One part is to say, the more people you have, the more innovation you'll also have, which certainly tends to counter this part. But the second, that's much, much more important is, it's really hard to do anything about directly. You can't just reduce global population because as, as, uh, as, as many people have sort of pointed out, uh, this, this sense that there's too many people is often, there's too many of you and just enough of me kind of thing that, you know, who's, who's, who are the people who should go? Uh, and, and that's not an obvious thing. But the reality, of course, is if you want to fix global, uh, sorry, if you want to fix the uh, population, you basically need to make sure that women have much more education, that they have much more power to make their own businesses and so on, because as they become more independent, they will also have fewer kids. We know this empirically, and we've seen that for a very long time, and that's also likely to happen. So for instance, the UN estimate for how much population we'll have by the end of the century estimate almost 11 billion people, which is a lot of people. But the IASA, which is the Institute for Integrated Assessment. I can't remember their whole, but they, they've done an alternative where they actually look at women's education. And what they show is that because women's are going to be much more, much better educated throughout the century, they'll actually end up having way fewer women. And so, sorry, 
way fewer kids. And right. so what we're likely to see is actually uh, a dip right after 2050, and we'll probably end up around 8 billion uh, by the end of the century. So yes, by all means, focus on, uh, on getting women better rights. This is hard to do from America to make sure that that happens in, 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 uh, in, in Bangladesh or in, in Ghana or wherever else. But it is part of that conversation, but this is not what mostly going to fix global warming. It's a very long-term process. It's something that we don't have much power over. Yeah, got it. Well, Bjorn, we've reached the end of our time. Could you maybe just, I, I'm sure that everybody watching today wants to know what they could do personally to make the world a better place. Do you have any comments on that? So a lot of the conversation around climate change has been about what should you do? You know, drive a little less, fly a little less, eat a little less meat. That's the way you're going to fix the problem. But of course, as the saying goes, if everyone does a little, we'll achieve only a little. The reality is, you know, the COVID crisis, the corona crisis has basically shown what happens even if you shut down entire economies. When China was entirely shut down, they still emit 78% of their emissions because you still have to live, you still have to heat your homes and so on. It just is not the right way to do this. This is not about you or me doing a little bit. By all means do that, and I'm vegetarian, but you know, it just doesn't make for a big deal. What will make for a big deal is two things. Partly that we get innovation right, that's what fixed most other problems in the past and that's how we should fix this. And of course, it is about getting this conversation back on track. Right now, it's panicked, and that leads to no good place. What we need to do is to get this conversation back to a place where we can say, this is a problem. How do we fix it? What are the smart policies? Let's do those, but let's not waste all the money that also could go to fix many, many other problems. And that conversation is what, what I'm hoping uh, that I'm at least uh, contributing to uh, with the book. Great. Dorn, thanks so much for a great discussion, and best of luck on your new book. Thank you very much. Our next Hoover Virtual Policy Briefing will be Tuesday, July 21st at 11 a.m. Pacific Time and 2 p.m. Eastern Time with George Schultz, who will be talking about learning from experience. The former Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of Labor really needs no introduction. He is one of only two individuals in American history who has held four, four different uh, federal cabinet posts. Throughout the course of his amazing life, the 99-year-old has acquired a richness of experience and wisdom that we can all benefit from. Please join us next week for this very special discussion. Also, to note for your calendar, some upcoming Hoover webinars next week. Condoleezza Rice, Scott Atlas, and Ed Lazier will launch a new speaker series on socialism and free market capitalism next Monday, July 20th at 11 a.m. Pacific Time and 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Senator Marco Rubio will be joining Lan He Chen for a Hoover Capital Conversations next Wednesday, July 22nd at 1.30 p.m. Pacific Time and 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You can sign up for these webinars at hoover.org. Again, thank you for joining, joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I look forward to seeing you next time.